Um, okay, but um, this now actually already brings me at the end of this um, welcome and, and, and recap session. And um, now we're coming to um, the keynote. And actually this year it was quite difficult to find um, a good uh, keynote speaker that match um, this particular event of the 10th anniversary. Um, but kind of last second, we managed to find, um, I think the best, most appropriate um, keynote speaker that one can imagine for this talk. Um, I guess many of you here have already heard about the famous philanthropist and uh, operating system researcher Peter Schmerzl. And um, I'm very pleased that this year we have the opportunity um, to introduce Peter Schmerzl as a keynote speaker. So, uh, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Peter Schmerzl, and uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about um, 10 years of riot development. So, in the next roughly half an hour, I'm going to give an overview, overview about what happened over the last 10 years where we are at, and um, at the end, take a bit of an outlook of where we are actually uh, want to go with, with Riot. Before we start, um, let me start with a quote of one of my favorite authors, Friedrich Dürrenmatt, who in his book, Justiz, um, said something like, we have to rethink reality um, to advance into the possible. So let us think what could have happened, what could have um, been in an alternate uh, reality over the last 10 years. What might have happened if we decided with Riot to actually collaborate uh, with one of the big companies, with one of the big players like Google, Amazon, um, Intel, whatever. Well, it's always hard to predict but actually chances are not that low um, that we wouldn't be here right now with such an event. Um, chances are actually quite high that riot, riot as such wouldn't exist anymore, but would have been integrated in one of um, their homemade um, operating systems, uh, which are um, hardly or can hardly be considered as free software, even though there are mostly open, uh, open source software. Um, actually, chances would be that instead of this summit, either nothing for there wouldn't be any community, or that there would be um, a high fee event in some fancy business building. And instead of me talking to you, there would be probably some uh, business business manager um, giving you now an um, inspiring talk about financial opportunities. Or we could have decided with Riot um, to specialize on one of the many domains of IoT, smart grid, smart city, smart home, smart health, um, you name it. Well, in this case, it's also very likely that we wouldn't have an um, event of, of this size. There might be more likely like five to 10 people meeting in a small room and a discussion discussing about latest advancement um, for a certain period like this um, diabetes meter. Or, um, as you already know, um, Riot originally um, comes from an academic background and um, the um, uh, point that we are currently here at a university means that we are still have quite some strong ties with academia. Um, so we could just stay um, in academic um, context. But what happens um, to a typical academic project at the end of the project funding, at the end of a PhD thesis or whatever, it basically dies. Um, and in this case, um, we probably wouldn't have this event um, here either. But now um, let me consider several, I think, less appealing alternative um, realities that could have happened. Let's take a look 
what actually happened, how we get there, where we are, where we are. Um, let me tell you some anecdotes, a little bit of where we are coming, where we, where we originally came from, where we started um, all of this, and then a bit of a retrospective on um, some features or some decisions that we took over the years in, in Riot, and um, do a bit of an analysis, what in hindsight turned out to be a good idea or maybe a not so good um, idea. And then at the very end of the talk, let us do some, some outlook in the, the future, what, what the next years, potentially the next 10 years could bring to, to Riot. Uh, I want to start with um, highlighting um, some lighthouse projects, some um, projects that have been developed over the last 10 years that impressed me a lot. And for that, um, I have to first um, um, assess the fact that 10 years ago, we decided with Riot that we want to become an operating system, not only for academic users, but for industrial users and um, hobbyist makers, private persons as well. So this is sometimes quite a, a balance act. Um, but over the last years, particularly here at the summit, I always learned about very exciting projects in all of these domains. And I just picked a few of them to demonstrate what people have done with Riot over the last 10 years. Um, um, one project um, from, let's say, more the, the private perspective that impressed me a lot was presented, I think, in 2018. Um, in uh, Amsterdam by Bas Stottela, who at this time was also a quite active maintainer in the Riot community. And he connected his entire new home um, with Riot powered devices um, to, the, to the internet. Um, so he built not only um, the hardware uh, himself, but also the software powered by, by Riot that um, now can control its entire um, house. And that's also a nice um, illustration that IoT is not always uh, wireless. In fact, there were a lot of cables involved, if I remember correctly. The second project I want to mention here is uh, from industrial context, um, the company Otakis, which is um, part of Continental, um, used riot-powered devices um, to uh, in, a, in a car sharing context. Um, so Vincent Dupont from, from Otakis um, implemented the canvas driver so the right devices can connect um, with all the electron, electronic devices in the car that it can um, connect via various wireless, connect, uh, wireless technologies um, to this device and control parts of the key, like opening the door, for instance. And the last example that I think is more coming from an um, academic um, background, but it's also super exciting to me. Um, so as we speak, there is actually um, one right device, at least one right device that we know of, um, circling around um, Earth in, in orbit in a um, CubeSat satellite. And uh, I just learned a um, few days ago that there's going to be a second one launching um, over the next uh, weeks. So um, we made it to um, space already with, with Riot, and I think that's all you can come out for as a software developer. But there are many, many, many more um, very cool projects that have been presented here at the summit or that you can find online. Riot has been used in wind um, turbines, has been used for energy aware um, urban sensing, has been used um, as a failover mesh network of our devices for a over mesh network um, for leak water detection um, or for um, counting the amount of um, water in the context of mines in South America. Um, if you're curious about finding out about more Riot project, um, you could, for instance, go um, to Hexta.io and check what people have um, um, show, uh, demonstrated there, or if you have your own full Riot project, I can also only encourage you to go there and post about um, your project. So next, uh, let us consider how all these um, cool projects 
have been made possible. And first, take a look at um, some numbers. Over the last 10 years, more than 440, 450 people have contributed um, to Riot in more than 30,000 commits. Um, that resulted in about 16,000 pull requests being merged, not counting all the unmerged uh, pull requests that also um, contained quite some very cool ideas. Um, alone on GitHub, Riot has been forked almost 2,000 um, times right now. In terms of code, that means that we have roughly 2 million lines of C code. That's a very impressive um, number at the, at the first glance. But if you take a closer look, you will actually observe that the majority of these 2 million lines of code result uh, or origins from CPU-specific um, code. So the actual number of lines that has been um, written um, by Riot developers and not just taken from uh, vendor-specific libraries, it's much smaller, which in my perspective is very, very good because it makes particularly the kernel very small, not only in terms of memory requirements, but also in terms of um, code that has to be um, maintained. Of course, there are other components that are more complex um, or has many more features than the kernel that requires um, much more code. First of all, the network stack. Um, but in, in total, the amount of code, I think, is still manageable. It's also a good sign that the number of assembly code is um, very, very low. Um, so we managed to achieve most of the um, things with pure C, at least at the operating system um, level. Um, what has uh, got a little bit out of hand is probably this build system. So alone in make files, um, we have currently 30,000 lines of, um, of code. In 10 years, we have published uh, 36 um, releases. On average, that results in um, 685 commits per release with roughly 50 contributors um, per release. So you can see there's always quite a um, big, vivid contributor um, community actively contributing. And um, also the number of um, lines of code that has changed per commit is um, impressively high on average. In total, by now, we are supporting 264 different um, IoT boards um, with microcontrollers from eight different CPU families, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit um, RISC architectures, ARM architectures, obviously, MSP430, Atmega, and so on. Um, we have support for 11 different network devices that can be used with six different network stacks. We have roughly um, 80 um, drivers for sensors and actuators, and we have uh, more than 100 third-party libraries that can be easily integrated into Riot as a so-called package. So after all of these numbers, let's do a little bit of more um, qualitative analysis, what have, um, happened over the last 10 years and what enabled all these food projects. Well, first and foremost, um, it is key to have a kernel that is as lightweight, um, efficient, and, and flexible as, as possible. So this kernel that basically was the foundation uh, for Riot enabled all of this because you can tailor it um, that's small that it will easily always fit on your IT device, no matter how small, how constrained it is, and then um, see how much resources are left to build potentially um, more complex applications around. The second thing that you obviously need in for an IoT operating system is something that supports the internet, that supports internet protocol IP. So um, our um, default network stack, the generic um, network like GNSC um, is also uh, a key feature that enabled all of these projects. Already mentioned the packaging system that allows us to easily integrate uh, third party code um, seamlessly into existing um, Riot applications. 
Um, we put a lot of effort in providing unified APIs of various um, layers, particular towards the hardware and um, upwards toward, uh, to, to the um, applications, so um, that you can easily switch your application, application from one board to another. And we have a very convenient to use build system, um, yeah. basically integrate everything that you uh, need um, very nicely so that you can just from the command line, not only build your software, but also deploy it on the software, um, interact uh, with the devices and even manage um, an entire IoT devices fleet. So, GNRC networking or networking capabilities um, in general are super important, as I already said, but let's take a bit of a look how we, how we get there. But it all started even before the official <coughs> starting point of right in 2011, um, where we had the idea to implement six LOPAN, um, IPv6 for constrained network uh, constrained node networks. Um, it took a little bit longer until uh, we actually um, were able to connect these devices um, to the internet. But in 2015, um, it finally we had our first success. So we first time we were able to connect the right power device to the internet. Um, by now, it really works like charm and it's typically only a matter of seconds um, to connect any um, right power device um, to the internet. Um, assuming that you have IPv6 connectivity, which is not always given. Over the, over the years, Riot has been presented at various um, fairs, exhibition, um, scientific conferences. I only listed uh, a few of them. The first conference or the first exhibition we went to were Linux Talk, we've been to CIVIC, we've been to Embedded World. Um, we, um, demonstrated right at the IETF Bits and Bytes event and at a couple of um, scientific, scientific conferences. And um, we also took part in um, some of these Etsy plug tests um, where different protocol implementers need to check if the protocol specification is good enough um, or uh, requires some um, uh, rephrasing. I mentioned already that over the years already a lot of industrial adaptation um, has happened. And uh, here on this slide, um, I just listed um, the companies um, that um, I knew of that has contributed um, to Riot. Um, as we are providing Riot as free and open source, we don't have actually um, the full control and full insight of who is um, using Riot. So these are actually only the companies that has uh, that have contributed back um, to Riot and um, used Riot more extensively as we know it. But Riot is not only about um, technical stuff, uh, but also very importantly about its um, community. And it all started um, very local in, um, in Berlin, basically in, in, in one office building. And this time it was easy to interact among the few developers working on the same um, code base. Um, but over the years, we were um, growing, um, adding more um, locations um, to the Riot community in different cities, in different countries, and even in different continents. So we required more um, sophisticated um, communication and interaction um, channels. And uh, actually, we have um, uh, quite a uh, uh, Few of them, not only um, for, for various reasons. So obviously, there's GitHub as a um, social platform um, to interact between software developers and to discuss directly code-related um, stuff, looking at single lines of, of code. But we also have um, various um, chats where you can discuss. Um, currently, the most actively is um, the metrics chat, uh, where you can discuss your right problems, ideas, projects um, in real time with other developers. Uh, we have, or we had, a mailing list which has been transformed to a forum a couple of years uh, ago, which was quite actively um, used. Below here, you see some um, statistics about posts per, per month, and you see 
Um, there are some fluctuations, but there was not a huge difference between the mailing list and the, the forum. <laughs> and we are having um, different kinds of regular events like hack and egg events, um, sprint days, or the summit. And this is the eighth summit, and um, the numbers um, of, of participants for this year are still missing here on this on this graph. Um, but you can see, and over the last um, eight years, um, we always uh, had some, something between 80 and 116 registrations. Not always all people show up, and this high peak in 2020 was um, part of the pandemic. An online only event, um, so it's hard to tell how many people actually has um, joined um, this event. So how did it all start? Where where did we um, come from? Well, whether it started um, around 2009 in a research project at Freie Universität um, Berlin um, for the research project together with German firefighters and um, the colleagues back then um, quickly learned that the existing software for um, the devices, for these microcontroller driven devices in the project, um, were not really well suited. It was very hard to learn these operating systems because they used um, strange programming language or pro strange programming language concepts. Um, and um, it was hard to find any documentation and um, they were not return capable. So back then, um, this project, FireWare, uh, Fireware um, decided to um, write their own software called FireWare, and um, the kernel of this new operating system was called um, FireKernel. And um, then over the next years, um, we um, rebooted um, basically um, this operating system for a bit of a more um, general purpose context, integrated first support, um, for um, IP networks and called it Nucleos. But it was still a pure academic project um, with a name that is hard to pronounce uh, for um, English native speakers or probably all non-German native speakers and uh, already um, registering a domain uh, with a Greek um, microsymbol um, is somewhat more challenging. Um, so we decided, uh, okay, first we want to change the name and we want to do it as a, a big open source project doing it the, the Linux style. And um, then we thought, okay, how are we going to do this? How do we start such a, pro such a project? What are good ideas? What should we um, probably avoid? And luckily for us, there, around this time, there was um, a paper um, written by one of the um, main authors, main um, inventors of Tiny OS, uh, who back then already had 10 years of experience in developing such software. So we took a look at um, his paper um, to um, check what we should probably avoid and what we should um, do. And the lessons learned um, that we uh, took from this paper was, first of all, keep it simple. Um, the easier it is to grasp for new users, um, the higher the chance that you will actually find good developers. Um, don't make the, the learning curve um, too, too steep. Stick to the standards. Don't invent own programming language or programming language um, dialect, uh, which makes it much more difficult um, to um, set up the appropriate tooling. If you stick to the standards, there's already a plethora of tools available to, to use. Build a community. Um, these typical research projects like Tiny, uh, Tiny OS and Contiki um, were um, pretty um, scattered. So there was not one community. There were a couple of researchers at different uh, universities or research institution, institutions that worked on their own problems, um, but they hardly contributed anything back. There was also because, that brings me to the last point, there was no um, central repository, no central um, source for, for all your code. So bundle your code in, in one location in, in one repository. That's what we did. Uh, we brought our code to, to GitHub, uh, went to all these exhibitions, fairs, uh, to spread the word about Bright, uh, and uh, we came up with a nice logo. But more about this uh, in, a, in a few seconds. Naming and finding a logo is a very, very difficult task for every uh, computer scientist. 
And um, just a few weeks uh, ago, um, I incidentally found this list on um, one of my old computers. That was a list of um, proposals for a name change from, from Nucleus. You can see um, not all of them um, were very um, useful. Um, in the end, we decided for Riot, which is quite nice uh, because it has IoT included um, and can be used as a backronym, if you like, like rather good IoT operating system, uh, revolutionary IoT system, or if you're not that convinced, ridiculous IoT system. Finding a good logo uh, was um, similar and um, challenging. And uh, because one of us is a designer, uh, we uh, decided to ask um, some, ex some external professional people for help. And we find a very nice um, designer that uh, came up with some proposals for a Riot logo. Um, the first proposals looked like uh, these. Um, we were not super convinced, um, so we came up with our own counter proposal, sent it to the, to the designer, and um, and he came up with some new ideas for uh, a logo like this or this. And um, after some discussion with the designer, we also came up with the idea, maybe we should have some um, a recognizable um, symbol uh, somehow in the, in the logo. And since internet and IoT is um, somewhat um, uh, ubiquitous uh, and, and basically it's always and everywhere, we uh, came up with the idea for the inf infinity um, symbol. And so he sketched um, some first <laughs> ideas and uh, finally he came up um, with this idea for a logo, which um, we liked quite a, quite a lot. And so um, we came finally up um, with this logo. But to be honest, it was only um, until we discovered how much um, nicer these colors look on a black background um, that we really started to, to love um, this logo. In hindsight, it has to be said that this logo and this corporate design helped us a lot during the first years when um, the code base of Riot was not really that impressive, um, but we always already looked nice. Um, we had a good slogan, we are a friendly operating uh, system, and so more people started to, to talk to us and um, tell us about their projects and ideas, which we um, used as input for further development. Another anecdote, um, who knows where this place is? Okay. It's in the UK, it's Cambridge. And, um, which IoT-related company is located in Cambridge? It's ARM. And um, back in 2013, some people from ARM ended, um, invited us to, to Cambridge um, to um, discuss potential um, collaboration, potential integration of Riot in their operating system. So ARM is building hardware, but back then they decided, well, we do not only want to provide uh, people with hardware, but also with software. So we need an operating system. So let's uh, develop our own operating system. And um, they contacted us if um, we would be ready for collaboration. We went there, had a nice discussion. I think they also liked um, what they heard. And then finally they asked us, okay, um, there are some things we don't like uh, about your uh, project. And the most um, important one is a license. Can you just change the license from a copyleft license to something more permissive, so that we can change, so that we can take um, your code and integrate it into our uh, operating system? And that was the point when I thought, okay, that's not exactly what I understand um, when I talk about collaboration. That sounds more like hostile acquisition. And um, that was actually the point when I realized that the license we decided on before. Um, Copyleft license protect us exactly against this and again, exactly against um, the first scenario that I presented in one of the first slides. Okay, now let's come to some decisions that we took over the um, years um, and um, let's see how we would evaluate these ideas uh, in retrospective. Let's start with 
good things is that with some decision that turned out um, to be a um, success story. Um, building ourselves, building um, the right code base uh, up on open standards and open source um, certainly helped um, a lot, um, made us made it possible to use a lot of existing um, tooling, um, debugging tools, um, network analyzers, and so on, and easily integrate into existing um, internet um, infrastructure. Um, so we don't have to implement everything ourselves, but we can um, just integrate ex existing external code in, into our code base. And um, because um, of um, the LGPL license, um, no one can just take our code and integrate it into their um, closed source uh, project. Um, on the other hand, we are free to take um, mostly whatever we, we want from other open source uh, projects. The second um, idea uh, of the second um, concept that turned out to uh, contribute a lot to the success of a riot was uh, right native. Right native, for those of you who don't know it, allows you to emulate um, an IoT device um, so that you can run an entire Riot application, including the entire operating system, um, as a process on Linux. And that enables a lot of new possibilities. You can easily scale up on a single machine. You can test um, big networks up to 1,000 um, Riot nodes um, on a single laptop. Uh, it's far easier to debug your stuff, particularly when you want to uh, or when you need to look into what is happening in the network. Um, particularly when you're dealing with wireless networks, it's very difficult um, to find out um, what is going on um, on, the, on the lower layers. Um, if you have this running in an emulation, um, you can have um, quite good control of what's happening and monitor um, very uh, closely what is going on in the network. So along with Riot Native, um, another feature um, that um, typically um, impresses a lot of people or make people to, to like right at the first glance is the shell. I mean, typically in an IoT device, you don't have um, a user um, interface. These devices are deployed uh, potentially at remote locations and uh, you don't have keywords, you don't have um, any kind of display. Um, nevertheless, during development time, um, it's very convenient um, to have um, this interactive control to change configuration uh, at runtime without the need of refreshing and rebooting um, your node, adding another, uh, another IP address, um, changing the radio channel, um, changing the password or something, whatever. Um, and also, if you use Riot as a tool for, for research, um, and it's very helpful that you can use this shell to control um, your experiments and gather the data via, via the shell. And with some of these shell commands, um, we tried to mimic um, the behavior of traditional Unix shells, um, which also makes it easier for people um, to um, start their first Riot project. But of course, uh, we haven't had only great ideas. Uh, we also had some ideas um, that we at least partly regret um, probably right now. Um, I mentioned GNSC, the default IP network stack in, in Riot. Um, we built um, our own IP network stack from scratch over time. And it has um, some very um, good concepts. It's very powerful, super flexible, but unfortunately also super complex. And um, one of the ideas uh, in the original design um, of the network stack um, was to separate the different layers of the network stack into different threads, um, which seemed like a good idea um, back then uh, because of um, the asynchronous nature of um, networking and by having multiple threads, um, you probably could easy, more easily decouple this. Um, but similar 
like in this uh, picture here uh, above, it's very difficult um, to follow a single um, uh, thread in, uh, in, in the picture um, translated to um, uh, GNSD. That means that if you want to trace a single packet um, through the stack by using a, a debugger, um, it can easily become super cumbersome and, and difficult. And I would say, Right now, there are only very few people in the RAG community that have a full overview about um, the GNSC um, network stack. That said, over the last 10 years, a lot of people complained about this um, design, but no one came up um, with um, uh, a working counter proposal. Um, so I think that is a good indicator um, how complex this thing is. And I mean, it is still um, super useful and it is working. It's just like maintenance uh, becomes a uh, burden. Another bad idea was um, how we use the make build system. I said it's very convenient to use it um, because you can use make not only for compiling, but also for flashing and interacting uh, with the hardware, which makes it very convenient to use. But the downside of this is that we are actually abusing what Make is originally designed for. Make is designed to be a build system for C programs. And even in just this job, we did some things pretty much wrong in, in, the, in the first years. Um, the curse of Make is considered harmful. Um, and um, it ends up with a very, very complex Make system and similar to GNRC, um, it's very um, limited to few people um, to have an understanding of how this um, build system uh, works. So we discovered um, this problem already a year ago and decided to switch um, to uh, another build and configuration system. We decided um, to mimic what Linux is doing and switch um, for kconfig. Um, but this transition seems to become a never-ending story. It's going on for years, and we're still not yet yet done. So, question is: um, Do we actually stick with cave contact, or do we um, come up with yet another um, build system solution? And finally, there are some decisions um, that were pretty hard, pretty ugly. And it's hard to judge whether they actually were good or bad decisions. Uh, one of these decisions is um, the license. In my memory, the discussion about or all the individual um, mails, forum posts, chat messages, face-to-face um, -face discussions that we had um, over the license easily exceed any other um, discussion topic um, that has arose. Um, over the years, including all the discussions about GNRC. Um, so we had a long discussion to come up um, with the um, license that we choose, LGPL. Um, the idea was that we wanted to mimic Linux style. We want um, to um, make sure that Riot stays um, free and open and that no single company can just like take over. As I said, from my perspective, I learned that this helped us a lot about this postal um, acquisition problem. On the other hand, that probably um, also prevented a lot of um, industry collaboration um, uh, proposals. Actually, many in industry um, companies won't get into, uh, even get into a discussion with us uh, as soon as they read LGPL as the, the license. It's very, very uh, difficult in hindsight um, to um, evaluate whether this decision um, was a right one or not. We could still change, us, change the license if we are really convinced that this is a good idea. But as far as I see it, um, we don't really know if a different license uh, would, would change uh, anything. Um, well, it would certainly change things, but not necessarily um, towards the good. Um, another um, yeah, ugly problem that we were facing was the design of um, APIs. Um, so right on the one hand, is meant to be a general purpose OS. We are not 
going into a specific niche. We're not only building smart home or smart health or smart city um, devices, um, but we want to enable all kinds of IoT um, solutions, uh, which make a requirement uh, analysis kind of uh, useless because we can just imagine um, all um, requirements um, in a particular um, context. On the other hand, in IoT or in embedded devices, we have like super huge heterogeneity of hardware. Um, so we are dealing with uh, a lot of different CPU um, architectures, very different um, network uh, link layer technologies, and very um, different um, configurations um, in terms of um, peripherals, memory, and so on. All the different silicon vendors doing their own stuff um, that is not necessarily compatible. So designing APIs um, that, on the one hand, um, will work on all these different um, platforms, and on the other hand, can cater for the needs of all these different applications is um, super challenging. And also what we all learned is that um, doing an API right in the first uh, round is um, impossible. Um, but even after iterations of these APIs, um, many of them are still not perfect. If you think about the different timer APIs that we had um, over the years, if you think about um, the different um, versions because before we came up with the current state of the Parrot API, which still is um, considered uh, not as final solution by most of the community, or if you think about um, our approach towards sockets. We started with POSIX sockets, um, then created our own um, alternative um, version one, two, three. And um, I think the version, the, the SOC um, API that we have um, is very, very good right now, um, but um, that remains to be, to be seen on the long side. And after all the good, the bad, and the ugly decisions, um, there's also one thing that I personally um, find always a bit funny and interesting. Um, who of you who ever used a Riot already has seen um, this line? No one? Probably you just don't observe it anymore. Um, or you have installed Twisted on your um, on your computer. Whenever you type in make term and have a Riot uh, device, um, connected and you have to install Twisted, you get this error message. I am the author of this error message. <laughs> and even I don't remember what exactly um, we use Twisted for and what are PyTerm's JSON capabilities. I have some vague ideas about having remote control over PyTerm. So PyTerm is a terminal program that you use per default um, to connect um, your host computer to a riot power device. Whenever you type make term to interact with the shell, as I explained earlier, um, you get Python running. That's kind of um, funny to me um, because I wrote Python initially more than 10 years back as a, a kind of a private, um, a private tool because there was nothing better at hand uh, back then. And for some reason, it just became like the default um, terminal in, in Riot and stays the default terminal, uh, terminal program in, in Riot over the last um, 10 years. Even though um, hardly anyone knows about all these features, there's actually no documentation at all. It has a lot of features like <coughs> JSON capabilities that no one, including me, knows about. Um, yet it is actually the tool that every Riot developer um, uses um, most of the time when interacting with, with write, um, besides make. So after this um, retrospective and about um, learning about where we currently got to, um, let's take a bit of a look um, of what is um, next. And um, who remembers uh, or who knows um, that we have a roadmap for the right project. Two, three, four, four persons. Um, I think we, the last time we discussed the, uh, the roadmap was a few summits back. 
Um, if you go to Riot um, GitHub page and check the wiki, you can find it very prominently. Yet, um, haven't been edited for the last three years. And, um, well, and that could be a good sign if you just decided for a long term roadmap back then and then we all, that we all um, follow. Um, but if you actually look into the eventual uh, um, individual points in this in this roadmap, you find topics like security, power management, build and configuration management, testing, documentation, which are kind of evergreen topics. And um, of course, most of these topics, yes, there is always some progress going on. Uh, and a lot of people come up with good ideas, um, but all these efforts are not really streamlined towards a, a common goal. Um, so, um, and I think actually before we um, tackle um, these um, individual um, tasks or these individual topics, we first need to um, have a common understanding of where we actually um, want to go. So, what is our vision to drive? And, um, over the years, with the growing community, having so many people contributing to write, that became um, much, much more difficult. Um, and particularly if you look, when we started, um, we created write as an alternative to this cumbersome, painful to use operating systems like Contiki and TinyRS. But over the last 10 years, um, other people, other big companies like um, Intel, um, followed our footsteps and uh, came up with their own solutions, uh, partly uh, basically mimicking, copying um, our um, ideas and, uh, and, and concepts. And on the long run, um, we cannot really compete with a company um, like, like ARM or uh, Amazon. Um, we cannot compete with something like the Linux Foundation, particularly of the, um, companies like NXP or, or Intel are heavily um, in, involved here when it comes to money and, uh, and person power. Um, well, we had a little bit of, of a head start. Um, so um, it took some time until these other um, competitors basically um, could offer a similar um, set of, of features. Um, but in the long term, um, they would simply outsmart us um, by more resources. Um, so um, you have to think about how to make right or what makes right actually distinctive um, compared to these competitors. And um, one very important aspect um, of um, being distinct from these competitors is our licensing model about being free and open and about the community aspect. Um, so actually, you, we, all of us, we make um, one of the biggest differences um, to this the operating system, uh, but we need to leverage um, this um, joint um, efforts. And we need to um, think about like what we actually or where we want um, want to go instead of um, just failing out in, in different directions. So over the next um, two days, one and a half days, um, there will be some talks um, about how we can more integrate other offer, uh, other programming languages, uh, particular Rust in, into Riot, um, something that also could Riot may, make um, distinctive from, from these other operating systems. Um, we already know um, that Riot has a lower memory footprint than most of the competitors. So that is also um, a direction we can, can focus on. Um, at least we should make sure um, that it stays um, as it is. Um, and when it comes on, on networking, right has a very strong networking uh, background. And I think that is also something where our competitors are still um, lacking behind. But on the other hand, I just learned uh, two weeks ago um, that um, even these big companies like Microsoft in their um, cloud backend um, still do not support um, IPv6. Um, so with our networking approach, apparently we are still um, ahead of ahead of time, uh, which gives us um, an advantage, assuming that things like IPv6 will become um, a common reality at some point. Um, what is for sure, at least from my perspective, um, it is mandatory um, that 
there is a free and open alternative for IoT devices, um, just like we have Linux in the internet world. Um, I don't want to live in a world where um, I'm surrounded by IoT devices running software um, that um, I cannot look into, that nobody can look into, and that they do whatever they want to. Um, I want to have some sort of, of control um, what is surrounding. Before I um, conclude this, this talk, um, I want to do um, something unusual in the, in the Riot community. Um, in the first years of Riot, we had this thing like a, a pull request of the months um, to reward special contribution, contributions um, to, to Riot. Um, over the years, we simply affected that everyone is doing their best um, and most of you are doing a great job in, in contributing um, to Riot and we are not um, emphasizing, not highlighting uh, some individuals. And if I think about like all the people that did an impressive job in, in Riot and that had real major impact on the Riot contribution, um, I could just from the top of my head easily um, name um, 30 different uh, people. But I want to highlight or just want to uh, mention a few names uh, that I think um, are kind of um, the, the unsung um, heroes. Nevertheless, even if I just um, mention um, a few people on the slides, um, the most important hero of Riot is its, its community. But let me start like with these single persons that sometimes may not get um, the um, uh, credits they, they, they should get. Unfortunately, um, most of them are not here today. Um, at least they cannot get mad of, uh, at me of um, highlighting um, them. Um, first, I want to mention Casper because Casper is actually the one guy who um, implemented um, this kernel that we are still using as a foundation um, for our uh, operating system. So it's fair to say without Casper, there wouldn't be uh, a riot. Um, if you just look at the hit statistics, you'll find uh, that the number one contributor um, is Alex. And this is um, even more impressive um, since Alex um, is not contributing to Riot from the beginning, but only stepped in um, I don't know, uh, seven years ago or so. Um, and um, it's not like only the sheer number of commits, he's like not collecting commits, but like actually his conclusions are um, super helpful in particular, if you think about all his um, SDM um, support that he has added, um, impressive what he, what he has done. Um, there's one person that um, you find rather low in um, the list of uh, number of commits, um, even though he has contributed for a very long time um, to write, which is Peter. Um, but what is not visible in the commit statistics is um, the effort uh, Peter spent into um, guiding, mentoring um, new contributors. So whenever someone came on GitHub to propose uh, his first contribution to Riot, Peter um, stood up and um, helped this person to integrate their, uh, um, their contribution um, with an impressive amount of um, uh, patience. And finally, there's one person who only contributed to write in the, in the beginning that I want to, to mention here, um, which is Ludwig, who implemented all this native support. And as I said, along with the shell, I think native is one of the uh, distinctive features which makes it easy um, to, to start the write. And um, I think what, what Ludwig did in the beginning of write um, with the native part is also uh, a very um, outstanding piece of, of work. But there's not only code contribution um, that is important um, for Riot, there's also um, all this organizing. There is like collecting um, money, it's like about making events like this um, happening. And um, here I want to thank uh, Emmanuel, Thomas, and, and Matthias um, for uh, what I called the executives. Um, like they um, basically make sure um, that we can have these events, that Riot is still alive, um, that there are always people hired somewhere um, that we have the money um, that we always need um, to um, proceed. 
And last but not least, let's take a look at some commit statistics. Some of them look like this, others look like this, and there's only one or two uh, that look like this. Um, the person who has contributed to the last 10 years pretty constant and um, it's not a low number um, of commits. And um, I hope, Martin, you are not mad at me, um, but a couple of times over the last year, I've always thought you are doing a really outstanding job in the, in the community as one of the persons who has contributed from the start and actually before the start, because you already did your first product implementation um, already um, before uh, we transformed into, uh, into Riot um, and stayed active and very um, helpful um, and super um, yeah, useful um, for, for, for the community. And um, I don't know a single person in the community um, who has any, any kind of, of problems with you. So thanks a lot, Martin. Actually, I hope that at the end of the keynote, um, we would have um, some more time for uh, questions and better actually spark some um, some discussion. Um, but I exceeded time a little bit, um, so we have to keep the discussion a little bit um, short. Um, nevertheless, any comments, questions, things that you would like evaluate completely or assess completely differently than, than I did, um, anything that, that comes to your mind. Yeah, all the people are hungry and ready to But we can also have the discussion over lunch.